Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Teresa Warner, and I am the 105th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through our programming, events such as these, while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through the nonprofit National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit www.press.org slash institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you attending today's event. Our head table includes guests of our speaker, as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you do hear applause in our audience, we would like to make note that the general public is attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalism objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN audience and public radio audience. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a Q&A. I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now I'd like to introduce our head table guest, and I'd ask each of you here to stand up briefly as your name is announced. From your right, Ken Molestina, news reporter, WUSA-TV. Rachel Ray, culture writer, Daily Telegraph, London. John Klobuchar, broadcast sports supervisor, Associated Press. Louis Mattioli McNally, president of Pocono Raceway and a guest of our speaker. Nikki Schwab, yays and nays columnist of the Washington Examiner. Brian France, chairman and chief executive officer at NASCAR and a guest of our speaker. Allison Fitzgerald, speakers committee. I'm gonna skip our speaker for a moment. Matt Milanarchek, president, Advocatus Group LLC and speakers committee member who organized today's event. Lisa France Kennedy, Chief Executive Officer and Vice Chairperson, International Speedway Corporation, and Vice Chairperson, NASCAR. Suzanne Struglinski, Press Secretary for Legislative Affairs, Natural Resource Defense Council, and an NPC board member. Maureen Grappi, Washington Correspondent, Indianapolis Star, and David Shepardson, Washington Bureau Chief, Detroit News. In just seven years, Danica Patrick, has evolved from an IndyCar Rookie of the Year to a racing sensation whose appeal, according to ESPN.com, hits just about every demographic. Her 2010 NASCAR Nationwide Series debut at Daytona resulted in a 35% increase in television viewership. She is considered by many to be the most successful woman in the history of American open wheel racing. She is the only woman ever to win an IndyCar Series race and holds the highest finish by a woman at the Indianapolis 500, third place. She has also been named the IndyCar Series most popular driver four times. Danica was raised in Illinois, began competing in go-kart racing at an early age, subsequently winning three World Karting Association Grand National Championships. In 1998, she moved to Europe to compete on the European road racing circuit. In 2000, she finished second in the prestigious Formula Ford Festival in England, the highest finished ever for an American. She returned to North America to race in 2002, where she became the first woman in the history of the Toyota Atlantic Series to have a top three finish and the first woman to win a major league open wheel race in a North American series. But most people probably first heard of Danica Patrick in May of 2005 during her Indianapolis 500 debut, where she set several records. Her practice lap of 229.88 miles per hour on pole day was the fastest by any woman in the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. She qualified fourth for the race, the best ever starting position for a woman, and also led the race for 19 laps and finished in fourth place. Another first for a woman. She received Rookie of the Year honors for her effort. At the 2009 Indianapolis 500, she finished third. 
the best result ever for a woman, and in 2010, she made her NASCAR debut racing part-time in the Nationwide Series. Last year, she continued to drive in the Indy Series and the NASCAR Nationwide Series. This year, she shifts from IndyCar Series to a full-time stock car schedule, competing in the NASCAR Nationwide Series for JR Motorsports and in 10 NASCAR Sprint Cup Series race for Stuart Haas Racing. Her first Sprint Cup Series race will be this Sunday's season opening Daytona 500. Today, Danica will discuss her transition from IndyCar Series to full-time NASCAR racing and share her thoughts on how she plans to become the first woman ever to win a NASCAR-sanctioned event and add another chapter to her list of first. Please join me in welcoming to the National Press Club, Danica Patrick. Thank you for having me here today. This is a real honor. Um, <clears throat> I pretty much just crossed out all of my note cards after all of that. That's really all I was going to cover. <laughs> I now will, in fact, just have to shed a lot more detail onto it. So, um, uh, but really, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I think the last, uh, last NASCAR driver to speak to the National Press Club was Jimmy Johnson. Uh, he since has been nicknamed five time, in case you guys don't know that. He had only won two championships at that point, but he's up to five now. So, um, so, uh, so his situation has greatly improved. Um, and then I actually just heard on the way here that the last driver to speak to the press club in this format uh, at a luncheon was Dale Earnhardt Sr. So this is some, uh, some pretty, uh, pretty steep company given the fact that I haven't even done a sprint cup race yet. So thank you very much for all showing up and, uh, and showing what I would say maybe some confidence in me. I, I very much appreciate that. I, I thought I'd, like I said, I thought I might start from the beginning and start from how did I get into racing? Well, once upon a time there was a family with uh, my, mom, my mom Bev, my dad TJ, uh, my sister Brooke and myself and we were just looking for a way to spend some time together as a family. My dad was a glazer and my mom was lucky enough to be able to stay home with my sister and I and my parents recognized that I didn't really know my dad very well. He was gone at work before before we got up and he was coming home after we went to bed already. So <clears throat> their first thought was to explore the option of buying a pontoon boat and floating down the river. So when they found a boat they liked, they called, they called a certain fella, I have no idea what his name is, um, and he didn't call us back. So, no pontoon boat, no good pontoon boat to buy. What do we do? My dad has a lot of history in racing. He raced snowmobiles, midgets, motocross, all kinds of forms of motorsports. I've never met a guy that loves racing this much. And <clears throat> so there was somebody in our neighborhood that raced go-karts. So we tr took a trip down the street and, and went into their little shed, checked out the go-karts, went out to our local track and watched them race uh, in uh, Broadhead, Wisconsin. And, um, and actually a track called Sugar River Raceway. They love it when I say their name. So uh, Sugar River Raceway. <laughs> and it looked like fun. There was like lots of kids and uh, you know, my dad was into it, and it was really my sister who wanted to do it. And I just, like any, any, family, any of you have kids, you can't let one do it and not the other. So I was the other one in this situation, and I just didn't want to get left out. So I said I would do it too. And um, so I was, uh, I was go-kart number 10. That was, the, that was the number I picked from, from day one in go-karting which is why it's so cool and why I picked the number 10 in Sprint Cup with, with Stuart Haas. So that's the significance there. So we got the go-karts together and we went out the back of my parents' shop uh, and there's a big parking lot. So we took every can we could find, spray can, Coke can, you name it. And we set it all up in a big circle and my sister and I went out for a ride. So we're going around, going around, it's really fun, wave to the camera, probably not, keep going. And, uh, and all of a sudden, I went to go hit the brake, and I have no brake. So without boring you on technical details, uh, <clears throat> given my 10-year-old inexperience, what did I do? I went straight. 
I decided to not continue to turn or spin or do something that would have been far less damaging. I went straight, and I was headed straight for a trailer, which would have taken my head off. So I veered to the left and went straight into a concrete building, hit the wall, cart up in the air, twisted, bruises all over. And I guess if there was any point in time that I could have said, I'm scared and I don't want to do this, that would have been a pretty good one, I think. But I didn't. I didn't want to quit. I wanted to keep going. Dad bought another go-kart, so thank you, Dad, for spending the money for another go-kart, and uh, which is actually where my mom picked up racing. But anyway, um, so we, uh, so so I got out there and we started racing right away. And man, I was terrible. <laughs> my sister and I were couldn't even keep up on the parade laps, which is those ones where you go really slow at the beginning. But I just kept practicing and practicing, and my dad tells me the story now, I don't remember this, but all I wanted to do was go, go out on the, on the weekdays. There was a Wednesday practice, and I just, I wanted to go out every single Wednesday and, and go testing. And I just loved to see the improvement. And it's very easy with racing because it's a lap time. And uh, you're getting better is quite obvious, which is probably why I like to do other things that cause instant gratification, like ironing and cleaning up. But not like dieting, that's not instant gratification. And I got really good, and by the end of my first year, I almost won the championship in my first year, even with those first few races that were, I'm sure, spectacular. Um, and that, that progression and that hard work continued, and by the end of seven years of go-karting, you actually found some stats that I could not find on the internet. I was trying like heck to find how many races have I won in go-karting? How many championships did I win? And I, so I had to make a guess and I figure I probably won, I don't know, one year I won almost 40 in one year. So I'm betting I probably won at least over 100 races and I'm betting between 10 and 15 regional and national championships. So um, I had some, some incredible success. But something that, uh, the, that also started to happen was I was starting to get some media attention. So it was pretty, pretty fun for a little kid to have cameras following her down the halls of, the, of her high school. So uh, the first program that I was on was this, uh, this show for ABC called Passion to Play, Making of a Champion. And you might be familiar with some other names that were in it. It was myself. We were 14 years old. It was myself, a figure skater named Tara Lipinski, and a certain girl named Anna Kornikova. <laughs> and so I remember being 14 and having a, a Sunday party for Danica's show and all my friends rode their bicycles over. It was awesome. <laughs> and there I was on Sunday afternoon special primetime TV. Uh, then, not far after that, MTV was following me down the halls of my high school and I felt pretty cool. Uh, but at no point did I really think that it was because I was a girl. Because I was always taught to just strive to be the best. It wasn't about being the best girl. It was about being the best. And that's what I was doing. Since I didn't want to be a professional go-car driver, I wanted to be a professional race car driver. I wanted to get moving right away. So at 16 years old, based on some of the people that I had met over the years, I had the opportunity to move to England and race cars. And this was a place that I was told all the best race car drivers go from all over Europe. And I could learn more in one year in England than five years in the States. And I said, well, sign me up. You mean I have to leave high school? Sign me up again. <laughs> you mean I, my parents aren't going to be living with me? Double sign me up. So, uh, but that, that novelty did wear off. And uh, it, was, um, it became really hard. I, when I first moved over there, I was sleeping on a couch and racing on the weekends, and it, it just wasn't going that well. Uh, and why? Why I had come from such, such success? Was it, was it because I was the newest driver on a race team? Was it because I was an American on a British team? Or was it because I was a girl, maybe? Maybe it was because I was a girl in a boy's sport. And it was really the first time that I started to feel different or out of place. And it really started to make me uh, doubt myself, doubt my abilities. It made me really sad and really depressed, as if the lack of sun wasn't enough to do that. <laughs> and 
and it was a difficult time for me for sure. It was very character building. Um, but I stuck with it and hung in there. And, uh, and you touched on it, but the Formula Ford Festival is a race in England that's held every year. And uh, there are over 100 or so entries every year in this race. And it's the, the best Formula Ford drivers from all over Europe, not just the ones that are racing in the, in the British Championship, everyone. And they all come together for this event. And uh, <clears throat> I had the ability to, I, I got a great hand-me-down. The guy who won the championship was on our team, and he was getting a new race car for the Formula Ford Festival. So I acquired the championship car, and I made the most of it. And I went out, and I finished second in the festival, which was not only the highest for an American, not only highest for a girl, but it was the highest for an American. I did this in the year 2000, and uh, the, uh, the previous, the previous um, uh, owner of that title was a guy named Danny Sullivan, and he did it in 1974. So, so it was, uh, things had started to turn well for me. And uh, I came back the next year for the championship, and everything just fell apart. I ended up leaving, leaving the UK and coming back to the States, and I didn't have a ride. And I thought, ah, I've accomplished so much. This should be, should be pretty straightforward to get a ride. I could learn more in one year in England than five years in the States, and I've been gone for three years. It's got to earn me something, right? Not so much. So uh, my dad and I would absolutely pound the streets and walk around every racetrack and talk to every owner and every driver and every mechanic and absolutely anyone that would just talk to us because we were that bored. We used, to take a, we used to take little field trips to the bathroom for something to do. And I'm not kidding you. Um, so we were, we were pretty lost. And it was uh, definitely a, a tough time. Uh, but we but we kept working hard, and it's something that I'm I'm used to doing. And one day, I put a guy named Bobby Rahal on the spot, and uh, he's a past Indy 500 champion, past uh, champion in IndyCar. <clears throat> I put him on the spot, and I said, "Hey, would you be willing to run me in a race car on your team? Would you be willing to start up a team for me?" And he said yes. I thought, "Gosh, why didn't I try this earlier?" <laughs> So he started up a race team for me, and we started to have some, uh, we started to have some success. We started to, to start to make a good impression out there. But what really started to kick into high gear was the media. And so all of a sudden, what seemed to be something I didn't even notice to something that might be hurting me is now helping me. And now it seems like being a girl is actually a really awesome thing. So I'm glad I was patient. <laughs> and it was, uh, the media started asking me this one question about who my, who my role model was or who my idol was. And uh, it was always a weird question for me because I never really had one. I always wanted to be the first me, not the next somebody else. And I guess maybe I kind of always knew I was different. And so I'm, I was, um, I was finally grateful to be a girl. I was finally, finally, finally able to use it to my advantage. And in the second year of the uh, Formula Atlantic Championship, which is a feeder series to the, to the IndyCar series, um, I finished third in the championship, and my boss, Bobby, moved me up, and I was going IndyCar racing. So finally, my, my dreams were coming true, and we started off the season fairly well. We, uh, the third race I was in was the was the Japan 300, which I would go on to later win. And um, <clears throat> I, was, I found myself vying for the pole position in Japan. And I, I just missed it by the littlest bit to an old friend from go-karting named Sam Hornish Jr. I went on to finish fourth at that race. And then we pick up at the Indy 500, which is my fourth IndyCar race. It really was like a, like a fairy tale month. Every single time I came in from the track, I mean every time, including rookie orientation, when there is only about five cars out there running, there was a huge cheering section for me. I could see them cheering for me when I'd pull in down the back straight and go inside, it, go, in, go on the pit lane and turns three and four. Everybody pumping their fists in the air. And I'd come into my pit stall and, let's face it, it's got about 700 plus horsepower and it's pretty loud. So when people ask if I heard the crowd, 
I heard the crowd when I stopped the car in my fit box. Uh, so I, I just got such a, such a warm welcoming. And the, 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 media, the media blitz started. And they followed me everywhere. And the opportunities just kept popping up every single day at Indy. And so it was, uh, it was very exciting. And to nearly have the pole position, if not for a little hiccup in turn one, which could have easily been in the wall, I saved it and managed to start fourth for the Indy 500. And then to keep that going and to, to lead just right up until the final laps of the Indianapolis 500. If it would have been just a little warmer in qualifying and I wouldn't have been so slippery, and if I had just had another gallon of gas, <laughs> well, maybe I wouldn't be here today. And that wouldn't be good either. So I believe that everything happens for a reason. And so the Indy 500 came and went, and all of a sudden, Danica Mania was born. And it's been an amazing ride of everybody dissecting, analyzing, loving, hating, judging, you name it. Everything that I do is, uh, is broken down. But I've learned to really embrace all of it. Embrace all that I am, all that, all that I am, being a girl, being different, being unique. And let's face it, if somebody is different and unique, it's a story. Just ask Jeremy Lin <laughs> or Tim Tebow. But it's really great, and I'm very fortunate. And um, I no longer be was just Danica Patrick, the driver. I'm Danica Patrick, the girl driver. And that's OK. People ask if I like being called Danica Patrick, a girl driver. And I said, well, whether you call me Danica Patrick, the driver that's a girl, or Danica Patrick, the girl driver, you're saying all the same words, and you mean all the same thing. And it's about intention. If you say it in a, in a mean way, then you know what? I can't help you. But, uh, but, but I love everything that it stands for. And I love being unique, and I love being different. And so um, you know, I always encourage everyone to embrace all that's different about them. And that really is what you need to use. You need to not hide that. You need to use it and take advantage of it and, and give all that you have to offer. And I've never asked for special treatment along the way. And I'm never going to hide the fact that I'm a girl, ever. That's obvious, isn't it? <laughs> So as I move into my, my new chapter of racing, being a full-time NASCAR driver, I'm going to do it with the same will and energy and the same Danica that I am when I was in go-karting to when I was in England to when I was in Indy cars. I'm going to be the best Danica that I can be. Thank you. Did you realize all of your goals in open wheel racing? Yeah, I think as an athlete, you are always, uh, you want to win every single time you take part in the event. I think that's, that's natural for an athlete to want. But my goal was to win an IndyCar, and I did. So in a simple word, I suppose you could say yes. What changes would you make in open wheel racing if you were in charge of the IndyCar series? Oh, that's such a loaded question. <laughs> I see no gain here because I don't drive there anymore. I'll talk about the real positives because, um, because there are some. Uh, IndyCar has a new car, and I've always thought that for them to uh, create some competition within manufacturers is uh, something that is uh, very good for the sport. It generates new money, new interest, and storylines. And also, from a racing perspective, which is, the, which is the product you have, and in fact, look at this, I'm going to get NASCAR in too, um, <clears throat> to look at, let's say, the, the, the Bud Shootout the other night was awesome racing, and the fans loved it. And that's what keeps people coming back. So when you can create some competition out there that makes the racing more exciting, then that's good for the sport. So I, I think that they're on a good track. And, um, and I think that the, that the new car is going to serve them well and create great storylines and great racing. Do you ever plan to compete in the Indy 500 again? Yeah, the answer is yeah, I do plan to. Whether or not it's going to happen or not is always a whole other thing, as I did plan to participate in this Indy 500 this year. But, um, but I, I think that in the future there's going to be um, more opportunities and more time to hopefully plan for it. Uh, I, I love that race. It's, it's it's the greatest race. It's, it's where I 
came from. It's what made me who I am, the brand that I am, the girl that I am. Um, and so I, I would love to go back and win that. I, I always really felt like I was going to win the Indy 500. And I uh, came close a couple of times, but I would love to have another shot at it. What is the biggest difference between open wheel and NASCAR racing? Where do I begin? <laughs> Obviously, the cars are different. The cars are open wheel cars in IndyCar, which just means the, literally the wheels are exposed. So it took me a while before I ever learned that one. Um, sad, right? And stock cars are obviously look more like traditional road cars. So, uh, so the cars are very different. The Indy cars are very low and rigid and, 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 and fast. Uh, NASCAR is fast as well, but the car is a little bit bigger. They're less aero-dependent on the wings, so, um, which is also what produces the close racing that we're able to have um, bumper to bumper. Uh, it was something that took some adjusting for me as a driver to, uh, to, be, to be used to being really close to somebody, but maybe being three or four cars back to coming to Daytona and having my spotter say, one car back, half back, you still got room, and I'm thinking, I must be underneath him at this point in time. Uh, so that, that, that ability to run close is a product of the fact that, um, you know, Indy cars work off of those wings to keep the car on the ground. So, um, and then you've got the difference in language, everything from the way that we describe the car. In Indy car, it's understeer, oversteer, and in NASCAR, it's tight and loose. And perhaps even the way that it's said. Southern accents? No. Um, so uh, I, I, I enjoyed it. The, in Na NASCAR racing very much reminds me of being a kid and growing up in go-karts and uh, there's lots of southerners involved and we use tight and loose as our ways to describe the race cars so I, I feel at home. Which driving skills do you feel you need to improve on the most to accomplish your NASCAR goals? I think the most important thing for me is just seat time. I mean, I, I've obviously been involved uh, in NASCAR for the last two years to some degree, but those two years that I've been involved, I still haven't done enough races that would equal one whole season uh, in a stock car. So I just need seat time. I need to go to these racetracks and keep going back to them. And uh, I, I, I really feel like the learning process will be quick to start with. Um, to get going on the season. It's always tougher when you get to the top, of course, those last few spots, but, but I think that the learning curve will, will hopefully be pretty quick in the beginning here, just being able to be in the car every single weekend. Um, so I, I, need to, um, I need to just work on getting familiar with the car, getting comfortable, getting up to speed fast and qualifying. Um, you know, for you guys that you know, watch and just think we go out and do an ordinary lap, they do things to the race car for qualifying that make the car handle in a way that it hasn't done all weekend. <laughs> so for me to be on the limit of that, of that grip level and have the faith in that car, literally the first lap I hit the track, it, it, green flag comes as soon as you cross the start finish line, that takes some real confidence and that takes some real faith in the car and trust and um, some history with the car <laughs> so that I know what it's going to do. So just, uh, just seat time is something that I really need. For the last two years, was it a challenge to transition from the IndyCar Series race one week and a NASCAR race the next? <laughs> I definitely got this question a lot the last couple of years, and my first answer is no. It's like driving, driving a van and driving a Lamborghini. So, and I like driving the van. I chose to drive the van, so please don't take, please don't take offense to it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but I didn't think it was very different. I, I didn't think it was hard. It was a lot of scheduling and travel and and things like that. But more than anything, I mean. My NASCAR venture suffered as me doing for when I did IndyCar. I wouldn't say my IndyCar racing suffered as for doing NASCAR because I was doing it consistently all the time. But in NASCAR, it was like I would do a couple races in February, and then I wouldn't do any racing until June, and then I'd do one a month until the end of the season, and then I'd have a few races at the end of the season. So it was very spread out. Um, I'm glad I did it the way I did it, though, because it allowed me the opportunity to say yes or no. I had never driven a stock car when I said yes to driving stock cars for on a limited time basis. So I'm glad that I I'm glad that I took that time and uh, and started um, started slow. If you'd never driven stock cars before, why did you decide to make this your transition and do that full time? Well, <clears throat> the the 
we work in deals. So I had a two-year deal to do part-time NASCAR, part-time full-time IndyCar. And after those two years, it had really proven to me that I love driving stock cars. I really get excited when I get in the car, and I look forward to racing it. I'm, I'm nervous, but I'm, I'm, I'd say that it's gone from like this much excited and this much nervous to like this much nervous and this much excited. So, it's, uh, it's, it's a much more of a, to me, it's a more of excited feeling. And the racing's a lot of fun. I feel like I'm tapping into my childhood again when I go back to the years when I had bumpers and I could uh, get aggressive and I feel like it gets my blood boiling in a good way. What's the biggest difference between the lead-in uh, weekends to the Daytona 500 and the Indianapolis 500? Uh, they're very, very similar in a sense that they're both really enormous events. Um, <clears throat> Indy, uh, the Indy 500 is not the first race of the year. Uh, which obviously this is our first race of the year. Um, but we would be there for a couple of weeks and there'd, we didn't kick off the, the month with, uh, with a bunch of media like we do here, but there was definitely a lot of media throughout. And there was a, probably a little bit more track activity uh, at the Indy 500 than we, than we might get here, but we get more opportunities to race and learn about the car in, in NASCAR. So that's really nice because that's what we're actually going to be doing on Sunday is racing. Um, but they're huge events, and what you feel is the long tradition. You feel the history. You feel the importance, the significance. And just uh, it, it really gets every driver to a point that they – really, really want to win the race, more than just showing up on a Thursday or Friday and doing the race weekend. Um, whenever, you put some, whenever you put a lot into something, uh, I feel like I want to do, do well even more, and this is one of those events. How do you prepare physically and mentally for the rigors of driving in a race? I just sleep a lot. <laughs> sleep is good, though. I'm pretty good at it. I'd say like eight or nine hours minimum every night. You're going to say that's why I look so young, right? <laughs> I'm 40. No. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's always important. Every, you know, diet and, uh, and working out's important. I was up early in the gym this morning, and it's part of my life. It's, 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 it's good to feel at your best, and what I never want to happen is to get in the car and uh, get tired at any point because there's so little, that, <laughs> so little that we can control as drivers that the last thing I want to do is let myself down in an area that I'm able to control. So, um, so, and, I, and I do it to feel good about myself, too. Uh, it makes me feel better to, to be healthy and to be fit and makes me look better in the GoDaddy commercials. So, <laughs> You said you got up this morning and worked out. So what is an example of your, of your everyday workout routine? I, I lift weights about three or four days a week and I do sort of anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes of cardio uh, pretty much every day. So this morning I did 30 minutes of cardio, and I did a lower body lift today, so it was pretty quick. It only took about 10 minutes, and um, with the lower body, if you keep after it, it keeps the heart rate up pretty good. So I, I, was, I, ha I needed to hurry and get pretty for you guys, so I could have drawn it out a little longer, but I didn't. So, How much weight do you lose in a typical race? Not enough. <laughs> It's funny, I hear from some drivers that they get out of the car and take the suit off and they're like, man, they're all lean and ripped. And I'm like, I don't get that at all. So maybe I'm drinking too much fluids. Um, I know you sweat a lot. These, these cars are much hotter than what I'm used to. Obviously, with Indy cars, it's open cockpit. Now, I mean, if you go outside and go running around and working out, which is kind of what we're doing in the car, you're going to sweat. But in a stock car, I, I believe, I've heard it's 140 or so degrees. Does, there, does anyone really know what the stat is? Did I get a thermometer? My watch has a thermometer. I should put it in the car. And, and is it that about right, 140? So I think it's been at least 200 at times for me. But if you say 140, fine. You mentioned your image and looking good for the GoDaddy commercials and never worrying about, you know, you are a woman and, and you want that to be known. Do you find it hard uh, being taken seriously in a man's world when you're using your sex appeal to promote your career? Well, in this day and age, 
and I've said this for a long time, it's about the package. It's about can you drive, can you speak, I suppose that's, the jury's out on that today, isn't it? Um, can you talk to media, can you meet sponsors, can you meet CEOs and presidents of companies, and can you be featured in ad campaigns and on commercials? And it's a whole package deal, and so I am going to use the package. I am going to use it for all that I, all that I can and all that I am. And the things that I do are never outside of my comfort zone. If they are, I say I'm not doing it. And so I'm really fortunate that for me I'm able to uh, show different sides of my personality through different kinds of things that I'm able to do as, as a race car driver uh, outside of the car. And so for me that's, that's a lot of fun. I very much enjoy shooting commercials and uh, getting made up all pretty and it takes the team at least two hours but I would rather you see me in Photoshop than right here right now in real life but um, but it's it's something that I like to do I enjoy being a girl and that's probably what people don't know about me is how much I like being a girl away from the track and uh, and that uh, that I that I that I can dress up a little bit but at the track I'm usually pretty minimal because that's the environment I'm there to drive a race car I'm not there to show you my techniques on putting mascara on and how nice it stays all day I'm there to drive the car You've broken into a male-dominated sport. What lessons have you learned in breaking the racing glass ceiling? I don't, I never set out to break any ceilings, to be honest. I was taught from a young age, as I said, to be the best and to work hard for that. And so I, I never set any of those intentions of, of being the first girl to do things. About the only stat that I ever knew was that, uh, <clears throat> that no woman's won an IndyCar, and I know no woman's won a NASCAR, but, um, but I, I, I would like those. But other than that, the things that just tend to happen as I go along. I, I had no idea that when I finished fourth at Las Vegas last year that that was the highest female in NASCAR history. I didn't know that. I find, about, find out about these things after, because my goal is not to be the best girl. My goal is to be the best driver. Are you friendly with any other women drivers that are currently racing in NASCAR's other divisions, and do you feel that you are a mentor to them? Yeah, I mean, I think some girls are friendly, some are probably less friendly. I mean, I might be one that's less friendly, who knows? Um, so I, I think that in passing, sometimes you, you know, there, there are girls that, that you get to know, but let's face it, there's not a ton of them. So uh, when you go to the racetrack on the weekends as a driver, you, I show up for what I need to show up at the beginning of the day, which is usually a rookie meeting these days for me. And then, uh, and then I get in the car and I go out and race and I talk to my crew chief at the end of the day and then I go back to my bus and get ready for the next day. So, um, so I have a hard time sometimes even seeing my teammates. Um, but uh, but there, are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of drivers that, I'm, that I get along well with, uh, whether, they're, whether they're a guy or a girl, to be honest. I've been exposed to men my whole life. I feel like they, they're, uh, they're, they're, nothing, they're nothing uncommon or difficult for me to deal with. Of all the NASCAR tracks you have not raced on, which one do you look most forward to competing on and why? Well, I can tell you one I'm not really looking forward to, and that's Darlington. I have a feeling that's going to be a handful, and maybe I'm speaking like I'm, this one might be blowing over the heads, but apparently that's a really tough track, so um, who knows, maybe I'll get on with it. I'm looking forward to going to Indy in a stock car, to be honest. I think that's going to be really cool. I'm really excited to see how, an Indy, how it feels versus an Indy car. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually looking forward to going to Talladega. I don't know if any of you guys are race fans and you go to Talladega, but apparently it's a pretty great fan fest. So I might have to uh, throw a hat on and drive the golf cart around outside and check out the tiki bars. But um, it's always fun to be a part of big events that have lots of fans there uh, because at the end of the day, as I learned from my visa to go to Japan, under job, it said entertainer, so we are entertainers, so <laughs> I hope you're entertained. Your racing career has taken you to some incredible places. Do you have a favorite? I've always loved Japan. Um, my husband and I, he goes with me to every race, and we just love going over there, the culture, the people, the food even, not all of it, but most of it. And, uh, and, and, and obviously I've had great, great success there. And so uh, I love Japan. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I love, I love Indy. I mean, that's a great track and I love Daytona. 
I just love big events, to be honest with you. It just it brings out an extra something, I feel like, in me, um, just knowing how much is on the line that weekend. Indy cars are much faster than NASCAR. Will you miss that speed? When I'm side by side with somebody and can't pull away from them, heck yeah, I'm going to miss that speed. <laughs> but uh, no, I think there's, there's, there's other things to, uh, it's, for me, I've never raced for speed. I've, some people, you know, I think a common answer, they maybe love to go fast. I, I do love to go fast, but as long as it's just faster than the rest of them. So if we were doing 100, I'd be glad to do that if everyone else was doing 99. So, um, so speed's never been my thing. So I, uh, I don't mind going fast, but just uh, my goal is to be faster than the rest, whatever that is. What would constitute a success for you in NASCAR? Winning. Hopefully you didn't think I was going to answer any differently on that one. I know it's a process and I know it takes time and I know that uh, I know I have a lot to learn and I'm still going to make plenty of beautiful mistakes, I'm sure. Uh, but, but, but it's about getting to victory lane and it's about running up front and it's about earning the respect of my peers and competitors around me. And, um, and, and as I learned from a young age, I do better when I have more fun. So to have fun. Why not, right? I can have fun even though it's my job. You talked about the other drivers. Uh, what, who do you think are the three most talented drivers you'll compete against in the Sprint Cup Series this year? There's a lot more than three. Um, well, I mean, I think uh, the first name that has to be said must be Tony Stewart, um, who is my, my boss uh, on the Sprint Cup side of things. He's, uh, he won the championship last year in, in high style. And so if anybody watched uh, the championship, I'm... I, I, I doubt you'll have been bored at any of that. So I think that obviously he's pretty good. Kyle Busch is pretty good. He won the other night in the Bud shootout, and he did, a, he did it in style as well, almost crashing the car a couple of times to come back. And unfortunately, slingshot right by my, team, my, my, my boss and teammate, Tony Stewart. Um, and then, I mean, I guess you got to – I mean, there are lots of them, so – Please, drivers, don't get mad if I didn't say your name. But obviously, Carl Edwards is pretty good, too. He ran, ran, Tony, ran with Tony Stewart for the championship last year and came up a little short. You talked about in your go-kart uh, your very first experience of crashing into a concrete building. What are some of the other scariest crashes you have been in? I kind of purposely left it, left it out of the story of my, my first year in IndyCar because it didn't make the story flow real pretty. But my first race in IndyCars had quite a big accident. Um, I was running top 10 in my first IndyCar race, and things were going fine, and there was a restart at the end of the race that turned into uh, quite a bit of crashing, and I was going underneath the accident to miss it, and a car was had a broken suspension and was sl slowly coming down the track and just clipped my right rear corner and shot me up into the wall head first. And, um, from that point on, I don't really remember much. I just remember waking up in the medical center to an absolutely blaringly bright light and looking up, and uh, <clears throat> my mom came up over my head, and a priest came up over my head. <laughs> and I looked over at my mom, and I said, Mom, what happened? She said, you just had a little accident, honey. You're going to be fine. And then I went to feel my legs to make sure I could feel them, and um, I uh, took a trip to the hospital. So uh, there was... I was very redundant. Asking, I was asking the same question over and over again on the ride over to the hospital, so I shut up, and then I got to go home. How do you decide uh, which sponsors to accept? Good question. Um, there are always lots of factors that come into a partnership with somebody. Um, first and foremost, does the brand fit? There's plenty of times that I've said no to brands that just don't fit and just aren't me, and I don't think it's believable to my fan base that, that I would be partners with somebody. So I have definitely said no, much to my ag agent's disappointment. Um, but uh, that, that, always, that is always the first thing to consider. Um, then it's, you know, some, some people want, you know, want the moon, and they want you to work lots and lots and lots and lots of days for them. And unfortunately, sometimes there's just not time. There's really just not time to, to do as much as a sponsor needs to, uh, to justify their partnership. Um, <clears throat> and then for me, it's always, I've always found, and I've learned this through, through, uh, through experience, is having partners that are ready to do an ad campaign and ready to do a print campaign or a commercial and ready to use me because if they don't use me one that's that's 
a waste because you're you're buying the opportunity to do that, and so when you don't, then you don't get you don't get ROI. Look at that, I slipped in a smart word, um, or letters I should say. Uh, so you know they don't have any return on their investment, and all of a sudden the sponsor goes away. So the best partnerships are the ones where they have a plan for 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 media and for for advertising, and then they start to get some return on their investment based on using my platform and my brand and my followers and fans to generate more business for them. So having great partners is uh, is very important. Do you have any funny stories to go with your uh, GoDaddy.com commercial shoots? <laughs> um, it's all funny. I don't know. I say, I tell you what, uh, these girls are troopers that, uh, that are um, not wearing what Jillian and I are wearing. Um, now, you know, that there's, we always try and have a good time. Bob always shows up, Bob Parsons, um, who... Uh, who owns the company recently uh, has investors involved, but um, I always said that we should do a little funny thing where you like find Bob, like where's Waldo, because he's in every commercial at some point in time. But um, <clears throat> you know that the the commercial where we were um, we were doing a contract, and it wasn't the first contract one last year, which is where we had to have these big GoDaddy. Um, balloons on us basically and we had to do a funny dance it was the one after that where he was trying to get me into a bikini bull riding and all kinds of really funny things I just couldn't stop laughing that guy was so funny so I just have a lot of fun with the people that they get involved for their commercials they're genuinely funny have you and Jillian become friends yeah yeah Jillian is a really cool really nice girl she's pretty intense as you could guess uh, but she's uh, she's really nice, and um, we uh, my husband and I recently went to South Africa for vacation, and so she had just come back from South Africa, and she had gone to a lot of the places that we went. So I got some uh, I got some advice from her on where to go and what to do. Uh, but she's a she's a good character. She, her and I, I think, play well together in the commercials, and we we recognize the ability to uh, how great it is when we have a little fun with it and try and get you to laugh a little. You talked a lot about the media role in your career. Have you felt they've been fair or unfair in your career? A whole lot of both, I think. <laughs> and I think that's probably typical in every company and every brand and with every, with every, with any kind of situation, really, anything unique. There's, all, there's always going to be people that are going to focus on the positive, and there's always going to be people that are going to focus on the negative, and people are going to build it up, and some people are going to try and break it down. And I think that's exciting. I, I don't mind it at all. I, I, we can, freedom of speech. So if you want to write an article that's negative, well, I might not give you a one-on-one -on -one interview and do an, do an interview for you, but um, but I recognize that it's part of what uh, it's part of what's great about our country and part of what makes it interesting uh, for the general public to read. Not everyone's a fan of me, and I get that, and that's fine. You don't have to be a fan of me. I do like it if you're a fan of racing because then you're involved. But um, but I like seeing you know I like to see somebody with a with a Danica Patrick shirt in, shirt on up in the stand standing next to a you know, Carl Edwards shirt or Tony Stewart shirt that, you know, they can have some fun banter up in the stands and cheer for their driver, and I, that's what makes it interesting. Do you hope to go into films or TV one day? And if you did, would you do a serious film or a spoof like Talladega Nights? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not really very funny, and I'm not super duper pretty, so I think that I, I don't know, I think I'd rather be on the other side of the camera. I think for me, I, I always, uh, especially with the, I mostly get exposed to commercials, um, I love being on the other side of the camera and seeing it from their perspective and looking at the image and the whole set in and of, in t together and how it comes together and the balance of it and the delivery of lines and I probably get too involved according to some, but um, but I enjoy that part of it. It's. I almost feel like it's a little bit more artistic. Uh, so, but would I would I like to do a little walk-on part or something like that? Yeah, sure. I was in um, CSI New York. I think it was last year or the year before. As I was a, I played a race car driver, as you could imagine, <laughs> which was nice. It was nice. There's a there's a lot of standing around, a lot of standing around, and then go, and a lot of standing around, and then go, and they're long days. But um, but um, I think that the more things that we can get exposed to as people, the more well-rounded we are and better perspective we have for all of it. Did you play any other sports growing up? 
Yeah, I did. I played a lot of different sports. Some of them weren't even sports. Uh, I, was, uh, I was a cheerleader. I played basketball, volleyball, band, choir, track, tumbling. I played t-ball when I was a kid, then coach pitch. Uh, so I played a lot of different sports when I was a kid, but obviously, you know, and I think that's part of what what got me to where I am today is that my parents were open to me trying new things and they weren't scared for me. I mean, Lord knows they could have been scared for me being a race car driver, right? Um, and I used to hear that a lot when I was a kid about, their, about a kid's mom not wanting him to be out there and they thought it was dangerous. But I didn't get that from my parents. Uh, so I'm, I'm really fortunate I came from a very open-minded family and a uh, family that, uh, that thought it was good to try new things. So I'm sure that that's why I'm par partly because I'm a race car driver. Okay, so you kind of mentioned it. There's some questions about whether NASCAR or race car drivers are real athletes. What do you have to say to that? <laughs> are we trying to see who can lift the heaviest dumbbell? No. Are we seeing who can sprint the fastest? No. But do we need to be in shape so it doesn't take away from our driving and our focus because it does end up getting to your focus? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, it's very hot in the car. Um, your, your, your heart rate is elevated the whole time. Um, so, you know, you need to be on your toes and you need to be sharp and you can't let anything take away from that. So, I've heard stories about drivers in NASCAR having their power steering going out, and I fear for that day. Because when I went out uh, here at Daytona for qualifying, I'm like, the steering is really heavy. Is that normal? And they're like, oh, you'll, it'll be easier again for the race. So I thought, Phew, good, because uh, that would be hard to deal with. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I IndyCar was, um, was a little bit of a different, different physical demand. There's no power steering in that. So if anybody's ever ran out of gas, you know what that feels like um, as your power steering goes out. So uh, it's, uh, it's a handful. And, um, uh, but in, so there was a little bit more peak physical strength needed in an IndyCar. But in stock cars, you need some more endurance, as these races are at least three days long sometimes, I think. At least that's what they seem like. So, uh, you know, it's, um, they're going to be anywhere from two and a half hours to, I suppose, four and a half hours or so, maybe even five at times. After a race, which parts of you ache the most? <laughs> <laughs> Usually my ego. Uh, that takes the biggest hit first. Uh, and then after that, I suppose uh, you could always uh, you could always go to the go to the back. I'm usually like, hey, hun. Actually, this morning, hey, my neck's pinching a little. Can you just rub on that a little bit? So, uh, we obviously have a lot of sort of this movement right here. So I really hope that doesn't get taken out of context or anything. But a funny picture. I should stop doing it, uh, but, um, but we have a lot of repetitive mo motions. So um, and obviously your forearms from the death grip are another thing that gets a little bit fatigued. Uh, so you do have to take care of those things with regular massages weekly. <laughs> do you feel you have an unfair advantage because you're smaller than your male racing counterparts so that your car can go faster? <laughs> you see how small I am? <laughs> How can that be great? Uh, they actually always said that drivers being small made it so much better to be a race car driver, and I really haven't found a lot of those, a lot of those kinds of opportunities. It is a pain in the butt to fit me in a car. I am like just that little bit too small that the pedals don't quite reach me, and the the, the gear shifter doesn't quite reach me, and then I can't see over the wheel. So. Uh, you know, where, you know, I get into a car and it's pretty much in its most, this, I'm talking about a rental or anything, the car is about as high as it can go and about as far forward as it can go. So uh, fitting cars is always quite a challenge. Um, and beyond that, if there was, uh, if there was really an unfair advantage to, uh, to being lighter, then, you know, I would have gone out and won every race in cars. So, you know, that didn't happen. So uh, it boils down to a lot more than just carrying an extra few pounds or so, and it comes down to, how you how you are on restarts, how you are at getting through traffic, how you how your team performs on the pit stop, I suppose whether or not I pull into my pit box straight, and uh, and 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 having that fire to get through the get through the pack and and try and win the race. How involved in you? Uh, how involved are you in the business aspect of racing, and your brand? I'm I'm very involved. I mean I I will say that uh, I I'm told that I'm one of those athletes that wants to be involved. Now, 
my agents would probably know better, uh, but that, that's, that's who it comes from. Some, some athletes don't want to know anything, and some people want to know a lot, and I'm par apparently I'm one of those that want to know a lot. It's important. I, I, I have always prided myself on authenticity and, uh, and, and being real, and so for me, if I'm not doing things that are believable and partnering up with the right people and doing the right kinds of events, uh, then, then to me, it's not doing any favors for my brand. So, um, I like to be very involved and um, probably bother my agents too much. How are you preparing for Sunday's Daytona 500? Do you have any pre-race rituals? I'm usually really nervous before a race, so I I'm, I never want to eat. I tell you. Uh, for those of you who think about eating when you're nervous, no, it's not good. Chicken doesn't look good. I don't, it just doesn't look good. So I usually eat eggs and toast. Um, that's the most common meal probably before a race as it's easy on the stomach. Think about when we're sick, that's what we eat. Uh, so, um, but for the most part, it's a pretty, pretty easy, pretty similar routine. I try to not break it. I mean, I sleep the, about the same amount every night and I don't try and go to bed any earlier. Uh, and I drink my standard two cups of coffee in the morning and have my traditional breakfast or lunch and, and get out there. Uh, you know, for me, it's about preparing throughout the weekend and working with my crew chief or watching some old in-car in -car races to see what it looks like from a driver's perspective um, or some old race broadcasts. But, um, you know, I think when you're not prepared is when you get the most nervous. And, uh, and so I just try and prepare as best as possible. Do you have a prediction for one, two, and three on Sunday? <laughs> Well, I sure as heck hope I'm one. Um, I know it's my first my first Sprint Cup race, so um, I don't want to set ex expectations too high. But um, but I think that uh, I think it's going to be interesting. Obviously, for those of you who did you guys watch last year or watch, never mind. Um, <laughs> We're bringing back some old style racing, which is going to make it uh, exciting for you. So go ahead and watch next sun this Sunday, and um, it, you know it's brought back big packs of racing, lots of cars packed into a very small amount of space, and so um, you're more likely to have bigger accidents when that happens because you can't get the heck out of the way quick enough. So you know something might happen to you on race day that was out of your control and you just weren't able to avoid it. And you might have been the fastest car in the race that was going to win at the end, but guess what? Your day's over. So um, on these, these kinds of races where, uh, where a lot can happen and, and a lot of drivers have an opportunity to do well, uh, it's, uh, you never really know who's going to do it. Obviously, last year we had a surprise win from Trevor Bain, who just had his 21st birthday the other day. Um, and, uh, and he kind of rocked the world and, and won the Daytona 500. So I think that's, that's what's so exciting about this race is that um, anything can happen. Well, before we get to the last uh, question, we want to present you with our official National Press Club coffee mug so Thank that it can you. help you get started in the mornings for your races. This will be my new coffee cup. Thank you. <laughs> And I want to let you know about some upcoming speakers that we have coming to the National Press Club. On April 4th, we have Deepak Chopra will be speaking. On April the 19th, we have Alec Baldwin coming. And I want to thank the National Press Club staff, the Broadcast Center, and the National Press Club Institute for all their help in organizing this luncheon. And I do have one more quick question for Danica. I want to know if you've ever had a speeding ticket or if you find it difficult to drive slowly on the interstate. <laughs> You know, I've got this question a couple of times lately, and um, I was doing some events for Nationwide Insurance, which is my insurance carrier, so I thought this was a very difficult question to answer. Uh, the answer is yes, obviously. And I think that it qualifies me for the job even more, so. Thank all of you for joining us today, and I want to thank Dana Patrick and wish her good luck on Sunday. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was good. That was a nice last question.